how do you understand God's word? That will either put you on the path of truth that God intended for each of us to receive, or the path, would I just simply say, the path of Satan, which is slightly twisted to make it more palatable so that you can accept it because it's beyond the scope of our human capacity to take something at face value and say, God said it, that's what it is, and that's that. This morning, I would like us to return to the text that we looked at briefly last week out of Matthew 16 and verse 18. Um, that is the declaration, Christ's declaration to Peter. Um, and I've said this is basically one of the texts, one of many texts that have been translated parsed, picked apart. It is a difficult text. There's no question. But when we go and look at the grammar, we can actually kind of understand that, you know, that whole Peter is the rock that could never be even from the translation. So I decided, first thing we're going to do is we're going to do a little, we're going to get all the difficult stuff out of the way first, all right? Um, so we are going to look at the Greek. And I want to say this for the benefit of those people who, A, they're going to, you know, I, I put up Greek on the screen and people freak out. I don't read Greek. I blah, blah, blah. Okay, so calm down, okay? <laughs> Just take a deep breath. When I do this type of um, work with you, I don't want you to get overwhelmed. So if you don't understand what I'm saying, See, grammar at first, I, I really get this. Most people, grammar is like, oh, no. It's like, uh, uh, I don't know, Dracula and the, again, no, no, right? Grammar, no. Uh, until you actually need it to start really peeling back and getting the clarity. And then suddenly grammar becomes this amazing, magnifying, clarifying tool, and you can't live without it. So understand as I do this, there's going to be some people that are just going to freak out in their brains. Please hold your thoughts because I'm going to try and make this extra complicated <laughs> and then very simple because we can do a little bit of both. So what I've done here is I have taken the text and I have morphologically tagged it. All that means is that I have put down what part of speech so this is the Greek of Matthew 16, 18. And as you can see, I tried to write the English of what is in the Greek. So you've got English on the top, the Greek here, for example, kago also. And underneath it, I've put what it is, what part of the speech. So adjective, adverb, I know that doesn't make sense, but when you morphologically tag, uh, I'm doing this also because I know I've got professors that watch me and I get critiqued like you wouldn't believe. Uh, <laughs> So, <laughs> adjective, adverb, noun, pronoun, nominative. So each one of these, this is a conjunction like we have in English, and or but, and so forth. So I've translated this, but the thing I want to highlight for right now are the parts of Greek language that will help us get clarity. So before I can do that, let's do this. So... I've got people that have been here a long time. They're going to know this is the, we call it the Greek grammar box. So you've got cases in the Greek, accusative, the accusative case for specifically now we're looking at nouns, is going to be pointing to, all right, you've got the dative, which could be, on, in, or under. You've got the genitive case, which is out from or out of. So the genitive form could be an analogous to when we put an apostrophe S showing possession. It can show the source of something flowing out. All things flow from the heart. We'd say the genesis of everything or we get our word for genitals from this word. So it's, it's the source of things. Dative, 
usually will be, as I said, on, in, or under, and the accusative shows movement in or towards. Usually we say, I'm, when I'm pointing the finger at you, I'm accusing you, imagine the action is pointing in that direction. And then, so these would be the, the we'll call them the movements. You would also have um, added to this, let's see, we've got accusative, dative, genitive, and then what's missing here? Nominative, which would show you usually, usually, the subject. And I know some of you are going, oh, it's hurting my ears. All right. Uh, and vocative, which we don't really deal with too much. I don't really need to say too much on that because these are the main ones. So why does this, knowing this, become important? Well, let me give you an idea. So let's look first in the King James. And if you read the whole passage, Jesus comes and asks his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I am the Son of Man? Who am I, basically? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, others Elias, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He sa saith unto them, but whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now that had never been uttered before, save in, we'll call it a more vague way, as John the Baptist identified and said, Behold the Lamb of God who taketh away the sins of the world. But until this time, no one had articulated this in this way. Thou art the Christ, and remember Christ as the Messiah, the Anointed One, the Savior, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. So this didn't come because somebody whispered in Peter's ear and said, Yeah, that's him. This was revealed by God, we'd say, in a way that we could understand it. Now the Holy Spirit revealed it to him, but the Holy Spirit was not yet given. And then this declaration, and I say unto thee, I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And if you keep going, I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind, and read on. All right. So part of what we're doing here is we're looking at how we got to where we are with certain doctrines. And one of the doctrines, which is preeminently the doctrine of the Roman Catholic Church is that Peter uh, essentially is the rock. That's how they interpret this, that Peter is the rock. And when Jesus says, you're Peter and upon this rock, and the translation goes that Peter is the rock, and there's a play on words, but there is a large problem with this. Equally, as I pointed out last week, uh, when he says, I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and I explained to you all of these ideas somehow that he was the possessor of physical keys is a cartoon caricature. The only one who possessed the keys, you read it in the book of Revelation, is Christ himself. He possesses, he has, he alone has the authority to essentially give life or take life, all right? So the idea somehow that the church perpetuated is that Peter possesses the keys, so he's the one with the authority, and that he is the rock. Essentially, that is what Christ, that's how they make it sound. That's what Christ said. The problem with this, well, let's begin with what the Bible says. It is by your traditions that you make void the word of God, the traditions of man. When we make something into a tradition and usurp the position of Scripture. So this is part of a big problem. To blatantly t take or seize something, make it into a doctrine or dogma, perpetuate, teach it to the multitudes. And no one questions it. But as I said, just the grammar alone is ripe with problems. So we're going to take a look at that first. We're also going to see if there could be a possible agenda or motive for this interpretation, which, by the way, there was. Not going to lie there. 
So the first thing we did last week is we saw the genders. So here we have Petros, Peter, and here we have Petra, rock. Now, we looked at that and we saw that the genders are not the same. So Petros, he is masculine and singular, and Petra is feminine singular. So just even if you weren't a grammarian, you didn't know grammar, if Peter was saying, and it's a play on words, if Peter was saying, you are Peter, and upon you, Peter, I will build my church, then we would have had Petros twice. You wouldn't have to change it because in the Greek, we have to have agreement. So I wanted to show you this, so maybe this will make sense, and I'm going to try and walk you through how we can peel back to see that can't be a right interpretation. So I want you to take a look at something. All the things that are highlighted with purple under here are nominative, okay? Kago, uh, also. Uh, su, you. Soy, to you. All right, dative, Petra. So, tata, ten, Petra. Sorry, I'll go back here. Epi, tata, ten, Petra. That's all in the dative. And then, sorry, these blue lines are accusative. And what I've circled are the verbs. So let's take this apart and see if we can't figure a couple of things out. In the Greek, nouns have gender, which I just showed you, masculine, feminine, or neutral. They would have number. So this would be masculine, feminine, uh, or neutral. Um, number would be either singular or plural. Then you've got the cases, which I just put up there. Nominative, right? Genitive, dative, accusative, vocative. So you've got your cases. All of that, those cases, make up how we understand Greek grammar. There's parts to the speech. So if you go and look at my, this box that I've drawn here, and let's just try first with one example. So let's take a look here. Peter, Petros, is in the nominative. That makes Peter one possible of the subjects in that verse. Now, please try and follow me because when you see this, you start putting the breadcrumbs together, it begins to make sense. Now, Petra is in the dative, nominative, dative. So again, if we were just taking the case, we would be saying the, the subject, Peter, would be doing something. So the easiest way for me to explain to you why this is messed up, I'm going to read this to you, and I'm probably going to read this to you two or three times. Can you see the dative case on here, where the dative case is? It's all, everything that's in that blue, correct? Dative. So, to you, upon, this, the, rock. Those are all in the dative. Dative case is used to show something or someone other than the subject or the direct object of the sentence affected. I'm going to read that again, and I'm going to do it slow, because this is where you can see anyone who reads this now. This is a grammar rule. Every grammar book, Greek grammar, will read the same way. The dative case is used to show something or someone other than the subject. Who is the subject that I just pointed to? Peter. Peter. Do you already see a problem? Because if Peter is the subject of the sentence and he's doing this, but Petra and the rest of that is in the dative. It, it can't, you're, you're kind of bound. The only way to interpret this, and I'll go back and we'll peel this apart, but the only way to interpret this is if you go back and you look at the whole context and the, the other dative that is connected when he says, flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto you, but my Father which is in heaven, dative, connected to the dative of what the revelation was. So the declaration, a simplified way of saying this, 
Peter's declaration that he makes, thou art the Christ. What does he say? Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Upon that declaration, not Peter. See, this is the problem. A, a thinking person is going to then say, well, if hold that thought for a minute. So you mean to tell me that according to the Roman Catholic Church, Peter's given the keys and he's, Peter will build the church. Essentially, that has to be the interpretation. There's a problem with that. The verb for I will build, it's Christ speaking when he says I will build. He doesn't, it's not speaking and put in the voice of Peter, you will build, but Christ says I will build, verb indicative, which is an action, based on a fact, present, which means starts in the now and continues. But active means the person who is speaking will be doing the building, will be doing the activity. So even if you just took the verb, I will build, you could never get to Peter will, will continue on the building because the building belongs to the revelation of who Christ is, not of the person themselves. This um, peeling apart makes it abundantly clear that if it was you are, your name is Peter, we would have had a completely different structure here to signify that Peter is the one. Now, granted, listen to me. Peter's given as an example on the day of Pentecost and he stands up and he preaches, but that cannot be the determining factor for Peter as a leader in the church, and the reason is very plain and simple. Think about this. Immediately after the death of Christ and his re well, resurrection and ascension, immediately people want to put somebody in charge to be the leader so that there can be, a, instead of Christ being the leader of the church, which he told us he is, and when I say man, I'm saying human, so don't, I'm not, it's not a sexist comment, but here comes the human ideology that says we must have a leader, we must have a human representative. So Peter actually is not the first pope because there was not a first pope. That whole, um, we'll call it grafting on or ideological progression comes much later. There were bishops, there were overseers, there were, there were positions in the church that we read of but there's something else that it becomes interesting when you start looking this a no way that you could get to parsing this and saying oh well it's very plain and simple uh, that this means peter is the one doing the building no christ is the builder so christ when he says i will it's christ speaking he is the builder alone and what did he say to the disciples follow me i'll make you something or not i will make you fishers of men that was not applied simply to Peter, that was applied to all the followers. So anybody who wants to say, well, Peter, Peter stood up and he preached the sermon on the day of Pentecost, then tell me what you do with a man by the name of Paul, who wrote two-thirds, essentially, of the New Testament. Are we to just silence him and put him in the garbage because no one elected him as a leader? This is the insanity. Christ said, I am the truth, I am the way. He didn't say Peter's the way and Peter's the truth or Paul, he said I am. So based on that, there could never be, this scripture makes it abundantly clear. Until a person comes to the revelation that only God himself through the Holy Spirit can give that brings a person to say thou art the Christ. Now, Peter uttered it this way, Thomas uttered it by putting, touching the nail pierced, the nail piercings and saying, my Lord, my God, because there, be, there the revelation came, oh my God, this is the Christ. So each one of them have a declaration or a revelation. We have two or three catalog for us, but to make it all about Peter is really an error. And in fact, if there's anything to say here to highlight, it's that when he says, and I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. That didn't mean that Peter had some auxiliary powers. It's exactly what the word says, forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven, which means the things that 
God has declared to be, shall be, and uttered as a promise out of the mouth of two or three, wherever we are gathered, he's in our midst, and we, we stand and rest on those promises. But to make it anything else is to twist the word of God. I, you can make the argument and say, but, but Peter preached the sermon on the day of Pentecost. It wasn't, it wasn't John, and it wasn't and you could go down the catalog. But I'm going to ask the question. Analytically speaking, if one looks at who actually covered the most territory and who was actually making the most missionary journeys and following up on their commission or charge, which they weren't a part of in Matthew 28, it's the Apostle Paul, not Peter. So to make the argument that somehow, the, and the Catholic Church is very abundantly clear about this, that he is the first in line, and then here we get this whole uh, apostolic succession. Now here's the problem with that. A simple and quick look of studying basically the history, we'll call it the first maybe two to 300 years of the church, you see very clearly that there were people that got into power, that crookedly usurped their way there. There are people that bought the position of spiritual leader. There are people that killed for that position. So you tell me that that's the way God promotes people, and I'll say, okay. But uh, I don't think it, it was meant to happen that way. And I don't think, if we're reading this very carefully, we are all supposed to be looking unto him who is the author the writer, the one who, who formulated our faith, and also the finisher of our faith. So how could the church come in and say, but Peter, and fill in the blanks? So it's very important when we do translation, for example, to show wh what is and what isn't there. So let me just finish the, the translation on this, because I want to show you something else. So let's just do this. I did this last week, but let me redo it also. Uh, and they, uh, I say to you, soy, that, or because, uh, su, you, are, Peter, and you notice there isn't, there is no uh, article, because it's a, it's a proper name, all right, Peter, Kai, and upon this, the rock, you probably would not translate the the here. I will build mu of me, my church. Oh, one last thing. If we're looking at this word ecclesia, which most people in this building, in this room, are familiar with, it is those that are, are the outcalled ones, not the building. So in the process of kind of peeling this apart, I realize this is a very complex swath of history to delve into, so we're probably going to do this in, in chunks here, because it's, it's almost impossible to show the degree, and I have to just use this word of bastardization that we've incurred in the church through people ta basically tampering with translation, and then because this, this verse has been so clouded, we don't actually get to appreciate some things that are said in here that if you put them in proper perspective are kind of mind-boggling. So let me start with the first thing. The first thing that's mind-boggling is in this passage we're looking at, the, for the first time we're reading, I will build my church. Previously, we read and encountered the word synagogue where it says Jesus was going into their synagogues Jesus went about all Galilee teaching in their synagogues. It doesn't say his, it doesn't say ours, it says their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. And if you keep reading, you're going to find this is where you'd find Jesus going into the synagogue. There was no church yet. But something that we don't actually get to appreciate and enjoy which will bring on another problem for the church. And that is, there was no church. You'll start to read the word church after this. I believe church is, 
It appears in the Gospels all but about three times. I think once here in Matthew 16, and then again, I think in Matthew 18, it appears twice, and that's it for the Gospels. The next time you're going to start seeing church will be on the book of Acts onward. So there's something remarkable about the very first thing you're reading here is the first declaration of Christ saying, I'll build my church, which was not the same as the synagogue. See, he went into the synagogue to preach and to teach, and that's great. But what happens is somewhere in the period, and it's not, it does not happen, it begins to happen during Christ's life, but it will become more and more Christians will be thrown out of the synagogues for one singular reason. See, up until this point, and the church has not yet taken on its final form, if you will, you've got a lot of converted Jews in the synagogue, and you've got a lot of converted Gentiles in the synagogue, and you've got just, we'll call it, a miscellaneous sundry of people. Now, the Christians are coming in, or even the Jews that believe that Christ is risen and what are they saying in the synagogue? So the law is being preached, the law is being proclaimed, and then the rabbis come and they say, does anyone have anything to add? And here come the Christians stand up and say, you know the one you were talking about, the one that no one can say who it is? Well, I'll tell you who it is. And they start telling and expounding on the scriptures that the person that they've referred to in the scriptures is Christ. <laughs> Out you go, okay? branded as heretics. So there is a huge transition from, it, this is happening while Christ is alive, but it will, it'll just pick up and become more and more to where there is a definitive schism between the synagogue and its attendees and this thing that is just coming into being called the Church of Jesus Christ. Why is this important? I'm going to tell you why. Have you ever, if you've been in the Catholic Church, anybody here been in the Catholic Church? That's a lot of hands go up, all right. You kind of can look around and see, um, we'll call it parallel symbologies, things that you recognize actually, and it's not, this is just as, a, as an honest observation that look like they come straight out of Judaism, okay? where you might say, well, a skull cap is a skull cap and a yarmulke is a yarmulke. No, the design is to have one's head covered. So just hold that thought and they basically look the same. You've got the same concept of, or if you want to call it a, a structure, of having the men and women separated except in the Catholic Church. It's nuns and priests and the twain shall never meet, all right? As far as we're, we're to be uh, thinking that way, all right? Whatever. It's not all black and white. That's all I have to say. <laughs> it's a little Catholic humor. Okay. So, yeah, never mind. Some of you former Catholics might find it funny, but here's the problem, though. When you see all of these parallels, the censor, where do, I'm sorry, I have to ask this. Where do we read that the first and early church was using a censer. Where? Now you might say, well, but they were reading in the Old Testament and they took this and they brought it forward. No, there's no instructions from Christ to do that, though. There's no instructions from Paul to do that. So you almost have to go back to when the church was in the synagogue. And now you're going to see some engrafting. And if you don't think that that's how things evolved into the way they are today, I don't know what to tell you. You can believe whatever you want. It is fascinating to me that when we analyze a lot of the, we'll call them ceremonial procedures within the Catholic Church, even if you do this with one eye, you can, you can see the resemblances. Now, we're not talking about the crucifix. We're not talking about certain practices that are uh, definitely different in terms of what we might do in a Protestant church, but I'm talking about in general. The importance of the um, vestiture, the regalia that's worn, the colors, where do you think that came from? Now, here's an interesting thing. If you watch the church develop and it basically splits off from the synagogue, some other faction 
is grafting itself onto the church, and that's paganism at the same time. So you've got Judaism and paganism that basically at an intersection go whoosh, like a magnet. Now they are stuck, and this is what we have now coming out of the church. So it's important to understand when we start, when I say something like the church needs reformation, I speak of the universal church. The tragedy is the word Catholic meant unified or universal in the sense of, in its earliest meaning, we are all basically uh, part of this one singular universe of God. It was not intended to be, this is the pure church and everything else is not. So again, you keep peeling back these layers and you have to see that there's been a lot of taking license or extrapolating. So this one text that we're looking at becomes a very pivotal thing. And now this becomes, and we might say, well, I've got people listening to me that they couldn't care less about this. Who cares if Peter's the one or if it's somebody else or if it's, you know, if it's uh, uh, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer? Who cares? It matters doctrinally because when you start to elevate Peter above the rest of the disciples, we're not given those instructions. We're not told that Peter will be the one and that basically Jesus said, here, I'm passing the baton on to you and you tend the store until I come back. It, it didn't happen that way. This is why we are to look unto him. We are not to look to, our, I'm sorry, not to look to our fellow man or to a priest. And this is why learning what's in this book becomes paramount. And this is how hundreds of thousands of adherents are hoodwinked every year, don't know it. They're not picking up the book. No one is teaching them. You're just told this is what you need to believe, and you can go on believing it because I've told you because, not me, but essentially the church says that's that. That's all you need to know. And my contention is we're not living in the dark ages. In the dark ages at work, when people were illiterate, they couldn't read, when there wasn't a printing press to print books, and all we had were one scant copy per parish divided up so that you had to take the word of the priest or whoever was reading out of the book. We live in an age not just where you can look at this for yourself, but it's available in probably every language and every version at your fingertips on your smartphone. No excuse. So when somebody says, well, I believe this, and they can't back it up, my first question is, where is it in the book? You tell me. Because let's just be honest. If we're talking about being children of God and being Christians, a Christian means a follower of Christ. That means you are adhering to what Christ said when he said, they'll know that you are my disciples by these following things. And part of that was not celibacy. It was not looking to Peter as the head of the church. It was not establishing some type of hier hierarchy because the hierarchy is of one that's comprised of the triune Godhead. Nothing else, there's nothing else under that. God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit, that's it. And then there's the rest of us. The rest of us globbed in here are the worst criminals, drug dealers, the Pope, me somewhere in the middle. <laughs> You, one of you standing on my head. <laughs> We're all there. That's the problem with this. It, it, it begins to do something. It begins to elevate a man who was just a man. Now, I have no problem in acknowledging someone's good work or, or their genius. I have no problem with that. But here we have something very abundantly clear. If you read the whole thing, it was Peter's the revelation that God gave to Peter of who Christ was, that this is the rock, this declaration in, an, in an, a disbelieving, not willing to accept that Jesus is the Christ world. You just declared it, Peter, and you didn't do it on your own. God gave you this insight. That's the message. So where did we get from that declaration you're the Christ, son of the living God, <clears throat> to Peter. You are the one. And again, you've got to look at these and, and look, seek out the translation. Something else that's also interesting, by the way, because I, could, I couldn't resist. I didn't want to translate the whole thing. But 
the last part of that verse says, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I, I had to kind of look into that. You know, what Christ was saying is blatantly right in your face there too. That the gates of hell, it means that the forces are constantly going to be trying to. They will not overcome, but they're going to constantly try to buffer, bring down, corrupt, pervert. So I'm going to ask you the question. Right there, right in that verse where the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, see what evil encroached to take that one verse right there where it says the gates of hell shall not prevail against it to take the scripture, twist it, and present it to a vast multitude as Peter is the one on whom we should look, and then apostolic and papal succession stems from him. Can you tell me how we got there? I just did. So the question is, why would people let that happen? And the answer is very easy. At some point, I want you to think of this, human rationalization. We need a leader. We need someone that everyone will look to. Remember, there's a little bit of a power play going on. People seem to think that James, who was basically trying to make the Church of Jesus Christ nothing but a splinter of Judaism. You've got Peter, who is part of the equation, but we referenced last week that what I call the first church council that occurred in Acts 15. Now, you tell me if there was a singular appointee there that stands out to you in that exchange as the leader, preeminent leader of Christendom. The answer is no, there isn't. They all came together to discuss. So even there is a template that tells you, yes, we may have issues we need to, we need to figure out, but we're not turning to one singular individual to say, and you were given all the answers because we know no one person has the answers. So we have that as kind of an interesting dynamic here in this verse to deal with. That's one. The other thing is, and I'm going to go back to this again, is the grammar aspect, which we looked at. And then last but not least, I might as well finish on this so I can move on to the rest of this message. So if we're clear, the dative, which is pointing out to you, which to you would be Jesus talking to Peter, right? And then uh, upon this, the rock, these dative things are referring to something or someone other than the subject. Well, they could only be referring to something or someone apart from the subject, which is Peter's declaration, or only one other thing which is not in agreement, which is Christ building. It's not even in the, it, it, it's not even in the grammar agreement. It's the declaration. So when somebody says, well, how would you know? Take this grammar to an honest grammarian and ask them to parse it for you. Now, somebody who's uh, leanings are Catholic in their persuasion, will try and figure out, but you can't. You're, you're at an impasse, I'm sorry. When you start peeling this apart, you realize it's, it is a complex verse, but there's no way that we could extract what has been extracted from it. And you just put a period there. It's what I referenced about snake handling in the church. It was never intended to be there. It was added by a scribe late and then people of the Protestant ilk picked, picked it up, thinking, wow, we're going to handle snakes, and we won't be bitten. We'll be okay. Well, you know, if you knew, maybe just put, put, put this in your brain as a cartoon that, reel that can play repeatedly, ongoingly. Imagine you had a really brilliant child, like maybe a 10-year-old that had a fantastic mind and said, you know, I can fix Daddy, scroll right here. I'm going to add some stuff in here that sounds really good to me, like handling snakes and other stuff. That, that would never have come from a follower of Christ. It would never have come from a follower of Christ. By the way, again, closer to the source than we are, but serpent worship was part of ancient cultures. Egypt, a lot of the Fertile Crescent, and we know the only reference to snakes that we have is the reference to when it talks about the Son of Man should be lifted up just as the brazen serpent was lifted up. So it could only be looked at as a concept that represented Christ or healing through God's prescribed method versus snakes out in nature. 
Hmm, try that venom on for size. I don't think so, okay? So that's something, anyway, that should be put into your thought process if you're going to parse something, to ask these questions. Now, I just read to you several, the one out of Matthew 4, where Jesus was in their synagogues. Again, it says in Matthew 9, 35, Jesus went about in all their cities and villages teaching in their synagogues. It never says his, it says in their synagogues. So, and in Matthew 13, 54, again, says when he was coming to his own country, he taught them in their synagogue, in so much as they were astonished. So the declaration in Matthew 16, 18 is radical because A, we've not had somebody actually declare something about Christ this blatantly clear, and two, it's the first time we hear Christ say something about this thing called the church, the ecclesia. Now, why is all of this kind of on my mind? And I'll tell you why. Because once we start looking at, as I said, how much we can look into the church and see where these things got grafted on, we're able to start picking them out, and we realize they never belonged there in the first place. Now, if let's go with a head covering, okay? I know what Paul says about head coverings for men and for women, and I'm going to say this to you, and I've always said this. There are elements to Paul's writing that are extremely Jewish, and they are very dated for their period. So what would have been a social must in Paul's day is no longer a social must now. If you told a woman in today's society you've got to cover your head unless you are part of Sharia or if you're a devout adherent of Judaism, I'm not covering my head unless I'm having a bad hair day, right? <laughs> just the way it is. Are you kidding? All right, just joking. My point is, though, that everything has changed. So when people start to lift these concepts and ask the question, where did they come from and why are they in the church, you almost have to go back to before the complete schism of the synagogue and the church occurs. And you'll find that as the church starts being referenced, You'll see it in the book of Acts primarily and through the book of Acts, I begin, beginning at, I think, verse uh, chapter 1 all the way through. You're going to encounter the word. It has some different uh, leanings. People like say, well, they're synonymous, the synagogue and the church. But they're really not, and I'll tell you why for this reason. And I've been saying this for a while, and people, I know I've angered a lot of people for saying this, but just hear me out. Why did Jesus go into their synagogues for to teach and to preach to them. Why? Okay, we'll have some Jeopardy music in the background, okay? <laughs> Hear me out. If their doctrine is supposed to be continued in perpetuity, we're talking about Judaism, why did he go in there and speak to them, preaching and teaching them about the kingdom of heaven? If you're reading... The Old Testament, shouldn't you be well-versed on the kingdom of heaven, so to speak? Everything that God has to say in the Torah is there, right? Wrong. So this only concretionizes what I'd previously said about Judaism. You know, we were talking about this on the subject of how come the ark isn't found and why does Ezekiel's temple have missing articles? And I said to you, because certain things will not be needed anymore. That includes the fact that that temple will only be built to reveal Christ to our brothers and sisters who are not of our faith right now. They will identify with that because that's what they identify. Just as Christ came in the flesh and identified as a human, the same thing will be true with them. Otherwise, they would refuse to acknowledge if they didn't see the synagogue. They would refuse to acknowledge that this indeed is Jesus the Messiah. So I'm going to ask it again, why did Jesus go into the synagogues preaching and teaching if Judaism was supposed to continue in perpetuity as it did? Do you see where I'm going? Yes, ma'am. But unfortunately, we have a whole host of people that they do this. They don't want to see it. They don't want to hear it. They don't want to know about it. And I know, as I said, this angers people when I say this, but if Judaism was supposed to continue as God prescribed it, 
then sacrifices and offerings as they were given would have continued. God would not have taken his hand off Jerusalem and let for how many thousands of years, uh, at least that I can think of off the top of my head, we're talking about at least 1,200, possibly up to mm, 16 or 1,700 years of occupation from other non-Christian nations occupying that territory with the main temple having been destroyed and nowhere did God prescribe for them to build another one. What does that tell you? That the last book of the Old Testament ends with a curse, but foretells of the coming of Christ and his forerunner, John the Baptist. What does that tell you about this way? God said it served a purpose. It was a schoolmaster to bring people to Christ. Now that Christ has come, the law has no place anymore, which tells you that Judaism would have essentially been looked at future but past as defunct, no longer serving its purpose. Does that make sense to you? Yes, ma'am. But we have a whole host of people that will not acknowledge this. This is why it repeatedly says phrases like, he came to his own and his own received him not. Who were his own? See, this is the insanity. This is the stuff that only, honestly, not even a novel, only the Bible could be made of this type of thing, where a man who is all man and all God, but who is born as son of God, who walked among the people to tell them their own story of what God said would happen. Imagine that for them to say, no, you can't be it. Sorry, we don't believe you. What will it take? Uh, will it take me dying and coming out of the grave again? Yeah, maybe then we'll believe you. Did that work? No. That's my point. But it's rather interesting because even just this passage alone, and now you start layering stuff, and you realize that this tells the story. Believe it or not, it's not the point, but it tells the story right here in this passage of I will build my church that must be different than the synagogue. It will not have the same customs. It will not have the traditions perpetuated almost like in roteness. And this is why when you come into the church in the book of Acts, it's something fresh, it's something new, it hadn't been seen before, but then you had people who wanted to make it just like the synagogue and perpetuate, including keeping certain practices. Those practices become basically latched onto the church, and as the church grows and becomes eventually the Roman Catholic Church, these practices from the synagogue never left. Now you, at your own leisure, take a look at what goes on in terms of practices and ask yourself, where? You tell me where Jesus said this is the structure of the church. Okay? If anything, you can say, well, Jesus wasn't prepared for this to catch on us and be as big. <laughs> okay. Whatever you say. My thinking is, no, Jesus knew this was going to spread like wildfire and that, yes, it took the Apostle Paul to come in and say, yes, there will be overseers. You know, this is not sour grapes, trust me. This is someone who has a heart and a desire. If I could only get people just, I know this doesn't sound very, what I just did today doesn't sound very spiritual. It, you know, somebody in another show, oh, I need the spirit. I need to feel the spirit moving me. I need, to, I need to feel that. Let me tell you what feeling this gives me, that I know that I'm standing on truth when I speak it, that there's no question that when you parse something like this, this is not based on some emotive or some ideology that was passed on to me, but you can see with your own eyes. That's the point of why I do what I do, so that you can go, my God, I can see it for myself. And I, I encourage you, if you don't read Greek, then go to a basic grammar. Don't look at the grammar of the English. Go to a basic grammar. There are basic for children, Greek books. Please pick them up, look at them, and make an application as you begin to see, whoa, 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 the same thing I highlighted with Call No Man Father. The context of that passage has to do with religious people, not your father on earth. So what else did the church get wrong? Again, I've, I've passed over so many of these for so long that it seems like if we could just grab hold of what is. You know, Jesus didn't give a rule book 
He didn't give some codified, you know, this is the prayer sequence that you pray in. And when you start thinking about it, what was so revolutionary and radical about Christ is unlike the law with its checkbox mentality. Christianity raised the bar, but also gave us basically each person greater insight into something. The greater insight is the law said, thou shall not kill. So you could just basically say, if I killed somebody, I'm guilty. But if I injured somebody along the way, I'm not guilty. Jesus turns around and says, if you hate in your heart, you're as guilty as a murderer. Helping us to understand what God meant in the bigger picture for our lives. So I'm sorry to say it like this, but how could you ever get to understanding the heart of God when you take the words that are in this book and you pervert, twist, corrupt them, make them to mean something they were never intended to be, and then say, okay, now you, this is the way, this perverted, corrupt way, now you follow and walk in it. How? So I believe, and I'm just going to say it like this, God gave me this insatiable desire or quest to at least show with, you may call it overly analytical, and you may call it very dry, but to show you why when we look for proof and evidence, we can find it. And then we're not walking along like thinking, well, you know, maybe, have you ever done this? Be honest. Don't, no cameras. Have you ever thought to yourself, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe, maybe, they're, maybe they have it right. You ever walk down the street somewhere and kind of spoke, you know, or you're driving, maybe they're right. And I'm, no, no, no. It's, it, this isn't a question of they're right or wrong. This is a question of how do you understand God's word? That will either put you on the path of truth that God intended for each of us to receive or the path, what I just simply say, the path of Satan, which is slightly twisted to make it more palatable so that you can accept it because it's beyond the scope of our human capacity to take something at face value and say, God said it, that's what it is, and that's that. So I think this, what this lesson does today is say there is a way to fact find. There is a way to figure out what is doctrine and what is not. And when people talk to me, about certain things. For example, questions I get often. See all these Hollywood movies. You ever notice something? It's always a priest, and the priest is going to be some type of an exorcist, and he's unsuccessful, and the demon is always a caricature. Yes, there have been cases documented, very scant and very remote cases documented, but for the most part, that's a fantastic Hollywood caricature of demon possession and of those who would exercise the demons. Let me tell you what that looks like in real life without Hollywood. Your child, at maybe the age of 16 or 17, hooked on fentanyl. You don't need a spinning head or green vomit or eyes rolling. Just one act that says, it's fun, it's good, try it, you'll like it. That's all. And it's so important that we keep making this caricature of what demon possession is so that no one will ever see it for what it really is. It is straying from God's pathway, his desired outcome for our lives, which is nothing but living the life of faith, which has some gray parts to it. Not everything is crystal clear. Not everything is black and white. But this scripture, by the way, is abundantly clear. So we will keep breaking down these traditions, we will keep, uh, I'm going to keep going on this until we can find the handle. Because see, if you look backwards and you're looking over your shoulder, I told you I was going to start first with Martin Luther and decide, no, there was trouble in the church before Martin Luther. I was going to start with Wycliffe and get to the 1380s. But there was trouble in the church before that. And all of what I'm actually talking about was now already in existence by the time a man named John Wyc Wycliffe comes along who's called the Morning Star of the Reformation. So let's go behind that. What else do we have to look at? Who else is there that said this is not the way it is? And you're going to find we only are familiar with several names, but there's a long list of people, including what the Catholic Church never wants to tell you, which is even in the Catholic Church there were people begging for reform for the church to get rid of certain doctrines and ideologies because they themselves were honest biblical scholars who knew that those doctrines did not belong anywhere near 
the child of God. So we will keep going, we'll keep looking, but I, I really want today to sink in for one reason and one reason alone. If you're willing to put in the work, and most of the people in the sound of my voice here are, but I got a lot of people at home, they go, oh God, she just wrote out this thing in whatever language I can't tell, and it's very hard for me to read, and I don't understand it. You don't have to, I just explained it to you, and I think I've explained it several times in different ways, enough so that this should be something of an inspiration for people who don't, if you don't read Greek, that's fine. But maybe you make it a plan that you start even learning the baby steps so you can follow along if I do something this or on your own. The wonder of what I call playing word detective in the Bible or word archeologist is amazing because you know what happens? You begin to see that what I do is not five minutes of looking up a word, it's a rabbit trail and it's, I mean, how many have had this experience? You open up and you're looking for one thing and it takes you down a path and now you're, you're, you've got five or ten different windows open. You're like, oh, okay, I think I have to stop today. My head hurts, right? That's what, that's what happens. But that's when you're really getting into the word and you're really, really trying to understand, grow, and learn. And that's all I'm about. I can't spoon feed you but I can give you the, the stimulation to say, I need to check that out, or, or this is next level. This is not uh, one plus one. And for some people, this may be too over the top, but I'm telling you, if you hang around, there is a payoff, and the payoff is this. You don't say, I know because I feel it. You say, I know because these are the facts, and this is what the word says, and the word properly translated, and then you can speak it out of your own mouth. My dream is that every person in the sound of my voice is able to, some, when somebody is proposing some ideology, saying that is not biblical. And as far as I know and to my knowledge, that is a man-made doctrine. Sorry, not interested. Then I can kind of say, good, good job, good job. That's what my, my thing is, because we're called sheep for a reason. We are susceptible. We are vulnerable. The devil knows that. It only takes one person who comes stumbling into the church innocently but is exposed to a wolf in sheep's clothing to tell them all the wrong information that they'll believe for their whole entire religious life. You cannot get it out of the person. So I'd say better for you to start in a place where you say, somebody took the time to show me, cared enough to tell me, and took the time to show and lay out so I have the ability that when somebody asks me my reason for this faith or this belief, I'm able to give an answer instantly in or out of season. That means I don't have to give the long-winded version, but I can. If you want to challenge me, and I'm speaking more about you, somebody says, well, yeah, where'd you get that from? Don't say got it from my pastor. You say, this is what the Word of God says, and you stand on that. That's my message. You've been watching me, Pastor Melissa Scott, live from Glendale, California at Faith Center. If you would like to attend the service with us Sunday morning at 11 a.m., simply call 1-800-338-3030 to receive your pass. If you'd like more teaching and you'd like to go straight to our website, the address is www.pastormelissascott.com.